A Marine Scientist's Guide to Logarithms for Mathphobics, a Kilroy Academy tutorial by Dr. Edie Witter. Take it from someone who knows. Being a marine scientist is one of the best jobs in the world. If it's a job you'd like to have someday, then you're going to need to come to grips with logarithms. This tutorial is intended to help you by explaining why marine scientists plot the change in pressure with depth on a linear scale while we plot the change in light with depth on a log scale. Pressure and light are two critical environmental variables that play a very big part in determining who lives where and why. Logarithms make it easier to understand these relationships. To understand why, let's first take a look at the changes in pressure with depth. Water is heavy. How heavy? Fill a five gallon bucket with water and try to lift it. If you fill it all the way to the top, which is actually a bit more than five gallons, it weighs about 44 pounds, or about 20 kilograms, which coincidentally is how much pressure you would feel if you dove a hundred feet deep into the ocean. Only you would feel that amount of pressure on every square inch of your body. If we look at how pressure increases with depth, we see that at 100 feet, we would feel a pressure increase of 44 pounds per square inch. That's the weight of that full five gallon bucket pressing on one square inch. Now imagine that weight pressing in on every square inch of your body from all directions. At 200 feet, that pressure doubles to 88 pounds per square inch. With each increase of 100 feet, we feel the addition of another 44 pounds per square inch. So if we project the graph line, we see that once we reach 1,000 feet, the pressure is equivalent to 440 pounds per square inch, or the equivalent of 10 full buckets per square inch. The point of showing this as buckets of water is to get across the concept that pressure changes with depth by addition. Now let's get rid of the buckets and do this a bit more scientifically using meters instead of feet and atmospheres instead of pounds per square inch. Let's list the values before we graph them, starting at sea level, which we label at zero depth. The pressure isn't zero at zero depth because even though we're not aware of it, we are experiencing pressure due to the weight of the atmosphere, which is the 600 mile thick layer of air that surrounds our planet. This air produces a pressure of 14.7 pounds per square inch, or PSI, pushing in on us from all sides every minute of every day. We don't notice it, but it's there. We call this pressure one atmosphere. Because water is so much heavier than air, if you travel just 10 meters, or about 33 feet down in the ocean, that pressure doubles from one atmosphere to two, which is equivalent to 29.4 pounds per square inch. At 20 meters deep, the weight of the water adds the equivalent of another atmosphere, so you would be feeling three atmospheres, and so on with each additional 10 meters adding another atmosphere of pressure. Until at 200 meters you are experiencing 21 atmospheres, which is equivalent to about 306 pounds per square inch. If you plot these points on a graph, you see they form a straight line. Here's the one atmosphere we feel at sea level, and here's the 21 atmospheres we would experience at 200 meters deep due to the weight of the air plus the water. The deeper you go, the greater the pressure, which is why marine scientists explore the deep ocean with submersibles or robots that are designed to withstand enormous pressures. It's these extreme pressures that make exploring the deep sea much more difficult than exploring space. Now let's look at what happens with light in the ocean. Unlike pressure, which increases with depth, light decreases with depth. Since the light at depth depends on how much sunlight is hitting the surface, and that changes with time of day and cloud cover, it's useful to look at the decrease in light with depth as a percentage of the light at the surface. If we make a table of how light changes as we travel downwards, we start at the surface with 100%. In the clearest ocean water, you will experience a 90% decrease in light for every 75 meters that you descend. So at 75 meters, the available light is 10% of what it was at the surface. 
Therefore, for every 75 meters of descent, you simply multiply by 0 0.1, which is 10%. And remember, multiplying by 0 0.1 is the same thing as dividing by 10. Travel down another 75 meters to 150 meters, and light decreases another 90%, so it is 10% of 10, which is 1%. Below this, there is insufficient light for photosynthesis, but there is still plenty of light for seeing because eyes are very sensitive detectors. Another 75 meters down, and it drops from 1% to 1 tenth of a percent, and so on down to 1,000 meters where all visible light disappears, and the only light for seeing is that which the animals make using bioluminescence. To give you a sense of just how profoundly and rapidly light changes underwater, compare this picture taken while the submersible is out of the water with this one taken just beneath the surface. Besides the fact that I'm obviously much happier underwater than above it, look how much the colors and intensity change. Now compare this one taken where the light intensity has dropped to 10% of surface levels to this one where it has dropped below 1%. It's obviously much dimmer, but if you look behind me, outside the submersible, you can see there is still plenty of light to see by. But what about in coastal waters, where there's more dissolved matter and scattering particles, so the water isn't so clear? Different bodies of water have different degrees of clarity, and that makes a big difference in where different plants and animals live. In some places, the water is so murky that light disappears very near the surface. To make the numbers easy, let's say in these particular coastal waters, the light decreases by 90% for every 10 meters of descent, instead of the 75 meters in clearest water. So to calculate the light at 10 meters, you multiply by 1 tenth, which is the same as dividing by 10. Descend another 10 meters to 20 meters and multiply again by 1 tenth, which brings the light down to 1% of surface light, which is the approximate cutoff for photosynthesis. At 30 meters, it's 0.1 percent. Not enough light for photosynthesis, but still plenty of light to see by. And at 40 meters, it's 1 one hundredth of a percent. And so on. For each additional 10 meter decrease, you multiply the previous value by 0.1, or 1 tenth. Because you are multiplying by a fraction, the numbers get very small, very fast. So by 100 meters, you are at 100 millionth of a percent which is a very small number, but on a bright sunny day, still visually detectable and therefore relevant to measure and plot. But by the time you get down to 200 meters, the number is so small, it gets difficult to write. In fact, these numbers are so small, they're not only difficult to write, they're also difficult to plot in any meaningful way. In this plot of our light values, we can read the first two values from the graph and probably guess at the third. But if the only information you had about light in the ocean was this graph, you might think that there was no useful light below 20 meters, and that would be very wrong. Compare the plot below of the changes in light with depth to the one above of the changes in pressure with depth. It's obvious that light is decreasing much more rapidly than pressure is increasing. This is because while pressure changes with depth by addition, light changes with depth by multiplication. And because you are multiplying by a fraction, in this case one-tenth, the numbers get very small very fast. Obviously the graph above is much more useful for seeing what's actually going on. If we want to make the light graph just as useful, this is where logarithms come in very handy. Don't let the word scare you. It's simply a word made up by the mathematician John Napier in 1614. It's from the Greek word logos, meaning reckoning or calculating, and the word arithmos, which means number and is the word that arithmetic is derived from. A logarithm is literally a calculating number which was developed to make up for the fact that people didn't have calculators, so they needed to develop shortcuts and tricks to make it easier to deal with very large or very small numbers. One such useful trick is scientific notation, where positive exponents are used as a shorthand to express very large numbers as powers of 10. The exponent indicates how many times to multiply by 10. Negative exponents are used to express very small numbers, also as powers of 10, but in this case the negative exponent indicates how many times to multiply by 1 tenth, or divide by 10. And remember, any number raised to the power 0 equals 1.
it is much easier to write a very big number like 1 billion in this shorthand form or a very small number like 1 billionth in this shorthand form. Now, if you flip this around and ask what is the exponent needed to express this number in its shorthand scientific notation form, you are asking what is the logarithm of 1 billion. The other way to write this instead of using the question mark is like this. Did your eyes just glaze over? Well, snap out of it. Don't let the notation scare you. Think of it in terms of these analogies. Logarithms are to exponents as subtraction is to addition or as division is to multiplication. When you hear the word logarithm, just think the inverse of exponent. So 1 million equals 10 to the sixth means the exact same thing as the logarithm of 1 million to the base 10 equals 6. Another way of saying that is that the logarithm of 1 million is the power to which 10, which we call the base, must be raised in order to get 1 million. It will help to remember this sentence. The logarithm of a number to the base 10 is the power to which 10 must be raised to get that number. Say it again. The logarithm of a number to the base 10 is the power to which 10 must be raised to get that number. That sentence is the same as writing the equation as the logarithm of y to the base 10 equals x, which is the same as saying y equals 10 to the x. So if you ask what is the exponent you need to express 100,000 in its shorthand scientific notation, the answer is 5, which is the same as asking what is the logarithm of 100,000. Hopefully you should now be able to answer those questions for each of these numbers. Remember, if you raise 10 to the power 0, it equals 1. And remember, you need to use negative exponents for numbers less than 0. Got it? Okay, now back to light in the ocean and why logarithms are really useful and not simply designed to make your eyes glaze over. Let's look at our two graphs again. The one on top showing the changes in pressure with depth and the one on the bottom showing the changes in light with depth. If we convert the y-axis of the bottom graph to a logarithmic scale, which is something you can do easily with an Excel graph, then the graph takes on a very different appearance. Now, like the graph above, the data plots out as a straight line. Look closely at the y-axis and you'll see why. The numbers don't change in an additive fashion as they do on the pressure graph. Rather, each step is a multiple of the one before. We start at 100% irradiance at the surface. At a depth of 10 meters, the light has decreased to 10% of its surface value, and at 20 meters, it's 1%. For this graph, each horizontal line is 1 one-hundredth of the line above it. To make these numbers less unwieldy, we use scientific notation, which makes it easy to see that each step on this axis represents a change of 100-fold. A 10-fold difference is described as an order of magnitude, so each 100-fold difference is two orders of magnitude. That's the magic. A logarithmic scale uses intervals that correspond to orders of magnitude. On a linear scale, steps increase by addition, while on a logarithmic scale, steps increase by multiplication. So a log scale compresses a large range of values into a more manageable form which answers the question we started with about why marine scientists plot the change in pressure with depth on a linear scale, because pressure increases additively or by addition, while we plot the change in light with depth on a log scale, because light decreases multiplicatively or by multiplication. One other trick that marine scientists use when looking at how different environmental variables change with depth is we rotate the graphs so the depth is on the vertical axis. This is different than what you are taught in math class because your x-axis is supposed to be your independent variable while your y-axis is supposed to be your dependent variable, the one that changes with depth. However, since in the real world depth goes from the top to the bottom, it's easier to think about changes with depth when you are looking at graphs oriented in the same way that the world is. The graph on the left, which plots the change in pressure with depth, is a linear plot 
while the graph on the right, which plots the changes in light width depth, is a log plot. In this case, it is described as a semi-log plot because only one of the axes is on a log scale. If both axes are log scales, then it would be called a log-log plot. Looking at these graphs, we can relate the animal distribution patterns we see in the ocean to the preferred light levels and pressures that animals live at, which is a very important part of understanding how aquatic ecosystems function.